Hello everyone, welcome to your partner in education, Agile Rank Mate. Today, in this episode of VT Workshop, we're going to be looking at some sample questions of the subject physics. So we're going to be dealing with these questions and how to solve them efficiently and in time. So let's start off with our first question. 5,000 kilogram rocket is set for vertical firing. The exhaust speed is 800 meters per second. To give an initial upward acceleration of 20 meters per second squared, the amount of gas ejected per second to supply the needed thrust will be. Take G as 10 meters per second squared. So you have options 127.5, 137.5, 155.5, or 187.5 kilograms per second. So how do we solve this question? Well, first, let's identify what's given to us. 5,000 kilogram rocket, that's mass. It's set for vertical firing. Exhaust speed is 800 meters per second, and that's RV, or velocity. The initial upward acceleration that's required is 20 meters per second squared. So the acceleration is 20 meters per second squared, and the value of G is given as 10 meters per second squared. Now, a rocket follows Newton's third law of motion, which says for every action, we have an equal and opposite reaction. So uh, by pushing the air down, the rocket fl flies up. That's the idea. So in order to generate the upward force, as per Newton's third law, we need to find the value of the force, which is to multiply the mass with the acceleration. This particular equation is one of the two results from Newton's second law, where we are conserving momentum. So the acceleration here isn't just A, it contains both G and A. And to illustrate that, let's draw a rocket. It's a weird model of it. So the gas goes down here, and that and that provides an initial acceleration of A. So the gas goes down with an initial acceleration of A in order to provide the same initial upward acceleration. Also, you have acceleration due to gravity, which is always downwards. That's G. So therefore, since they're in the same direction, we add them together. So therefore, M times G plus A is 10 plus 20, and the mass is 5,000 kilograms. So therefore, the value of force would be 5,000 times 30, which will be 150,000 newtons. So the value of the upward force is 150,000 newtons. Now, the question that's asked of us is to find out the amount of gas ejected, which basically translates to the loss rate, the rate of loss of mass with respect to time. Now, how do we find that out? Well, according to Newton's second law, force is when either mass or velocity uh, is, well, undergoing a rate of change and the other one is staying constant. So for a constant mass, the velocity is changing with respect to time. But another and equally likely option is when the mass is changing with time to attain a constant velocity. So both of these apply to Newton's second law, which is where the conservation of momentum comes in. The rocket, while, while trying to go upward, applies the second equation. So when the gas is burnt up, it loses mass, and that helps it maintain a constant velocity as it goes up with an upward force. So here, we need to find out dm by dt, that's the rate of loss of mass, by dividing force with velocity. We already know the velocity here to be 800 meters per second. So we just have to divide 150,000 over 800. So we can cut out those two zeros. It's basically 1,500 over 8. So 8 times 1 is 8. It gives you 7. Put, pull the zero down, 8 times 8 is 64, remainder 6, pull the last zero down, you have um, 8 times 7 to be 56, 
and then you have a 4, put a point, and then you can add a 0. 8 times 5 gives you 40. So therefore, 187.5 kilograms per second is the rate of change of mass. So if we were to look at the options, it's clear that option D would be the right answer. So when the 5,000 kilogram rocket has an exhaust speed of 800 meters per second with an initial upward acceleration of 20 meters per second squared, the amount of gas that's needed to be ejected is 187.5 kilograms per second. So you could have got that answer by, you know, uh, by, you know, s simplifying the division because, you know, when you have 1500 over 8, if you try after the first per step, you'll get 8 and then 7. And then at 70, you would get 8, 8, 8 to 64. So at this step, you would notice that it's the only option that corresponds to that value would be option D. So therefore, it becomes the right option. Now, let's look at another question. Which of the following does not support the wave, wave nature of light? So we have some phenomena corresponding with light. One of these uh, is explained by the particle nature and not by the wave nature. We need to find out which one. So we have interference, diffraction, polarization, photoelectric effect. Now let's look at each of them. In interference, light passes through two slits onto a screen which forms an interference pattern. Now this is a very vague distrib it's a very vague vague way to, you know, show it, but this is how it would roughly look like. So this is what we call interference. Light passes through two slits and cancels out the troughs and it accentuates the crests in order to form an interference pattern. So that's option A. So in order for this to work, you need the wave nature of light. It's explained by the wave nature, so therefore option A is incorrect. Option B is diffraction. This is where a light ray goes through one slit onto a screen. However, due to the wave nature of light, there is a crest followed by a trough and then a crest followed by a trough, etc. So we have a diffraction pattern consisting of alternating bands of light and dark. So therefore, option B, diffraction is also dependent upon the wave nature. So option B is incorrect. Option C is polarization. This is where light rays pass through a plane and this is done by passing them through various slits in order to form a plane through which light passes. This is particularly uh, found in tints used for you know sunglasses and stuff. So therefore option C polarization again light ray the light wave passes through a particular plane so therefore this depends on the wave nature so option C is incorrect. That makes option D the photoelectric effect the right answer. In the photoelectric effect, you would know that when light rays strike an object, an electron is released. In order for this to happen, you need momentum in light, and momentum is usually found and is usually a property of the particles. So if you had used the particle nature to explain photoelectric effect, it would make sense. So therefore, option D, the photoelectric effect, is the right answer. Now you could have speeded up this process by looking at each of the process. You know that polarization is related to sunglasses and interference and diffraction we would have studied in grade 12 were related to the wave nature and the photoelectric effect you would have related that to solar cells which produce electricity. So for that you need you know a particle nature somehow. So therefore option D is the correct option in this question. Now let's look at the final question of this episode. Six identical conducting rods are joined as shown in the figure. Points A and D are maintained at 200 degrees Celsius and 20 degrees Celsius respectively. The temperature of the junction B, we need to find the temperature in this particular spot. So how do we solve this question? Well, since we know that these are conducting rods, every conducting rod would have a resistance Let's consider that to be R. And since these rods are identical, we can 
use the variable measurement in order to find out the in order to draw an electric circuit diagram. So you have a circuit diagram that goes like this. This is A, this is B, this is C, and this is D. And then the resistor here, the resistors between A, B, and C, D are R and R. The resistances between B, C are two R's for both sides. So, this is how the uh, this is how this uh, figure would be set up in an electric circuit diagram. So over here, we would consider the voltage to be the temperature difference. We would consider the current to be the loss in temperature per resistor or per rod. And then we will consider that um, the resistance per se as the rods. Okay. Now, the temperature difference. We have 200 degrees Celsius at A and 20 degrees Celsius at B, so the temperature difference can be easily calculated as 200 minus 20, which is 180 degrees Celsius. Now, let's use the electric circuit to solve the problem. Now, BC contains a parallel connection of resistors, so the resistor, so the resistance of BC would be solved by using the parallel method. So 1 by RBC is 1 by 2R plus 1 by 2R, which is basically 2 by 2R, which can be shortened to 1 over R. So therefore, the resistance of BC is R ohms. Now, the total resistance would be resistance of AB plus resistance of BC plus resistance of CD which would be R plus R plus R, and that would be 3R. Now, we need to find the current, which would be V over R, which in this case is 180 over 3R, which means it'll be 60 over R. What does it mean by R being, I mean, what does it mean by I being 60 over R? That means, across a rod, the temperature difference will be 60 degrees Celsius. Now, we need to find out the temperature at junction B. So we know that current flows one way, temperature also flows one way. So it goes from higher, so, you know, heat flows from higher temperature to lower temperature. So heat will flow from A to D. So therefore, the temperature at B can be calculated as the temperature at A minus the temperature difference across AB. Now AB in our circuit diagram is just one resistor, so therefore uh, it means that there's only one rod present. So that means there's a temperature difference of 60 degrees. The temperature at A is 200 degrees Celsius. When you subtract 60 degrees Celsius from there, the temperature at B is 140 degrees Celsius. So therefore, the answer to this question, that's the temperature of junction B, is option C. 140 degrees Celsius. The other options are incorrect because according to the problem that we've solved, 140 degrees is the temperature of junction B. So we used aspects of <clears throat> electricity in order to solve a thermal problem. This can be used in cases where there are identical objects. When they're not identical, then, they're, then this approach doesn't work correctly. So that concludes this episode of Witty Workshop. We hope you found this episode interesting. For more of our useful and interesting content, don't forget to subscribe to our channel, the Agile Rank Mate, which is your partner in education. Also, don't forget to hit the notifications icon if you want to get the latest updates from our channel. So until the next episode, take care, stay alert, bye-bye for now.